yesterday's session so we were speaking about operators access groups roles and role to object okay so operator is a data instance okay it's just details about a user who is able to log in into pega so we store his personal information his professional information his scheduled absence his reporting details and all these things and operator information is stored in a table pr underscore operators and the most important thing that you hold in an operator id is access group one operator can hold multiple access groups and the one which is highlighted would be the primary access group the rest would be optional and what is an access group contain it contains application portals roles so application decides which application you can access access group can hold only one application inside it whereas you can have multiple portals and roles so portals the web page that you see when you log in depending upon your role in the organization so you might be watching as a developer portal or an admin portal or user portal depends upon the role in the organization then comes the concept of roles so role is the role you play in an organization you will you will create a variable called as role and then you use it in your functionality like a visible when condition or to you know you just put some condition saying that if the user has this rule perform something if not do not perform something kind of coding you will be writing then an extension to this role is role to object which gives more granular control over the code so you you control the access at different environment levels like uh like dev qa uat and all these things this is role to object where you will define numbers 1 2 3 4 5 5 for your environments and you will be controlling it okay so this is what we have discussed yesterday let me know if you have any questions um if not we'll go with the next one that is privileges okay privilege so privilege as the name itself indicates it's again another kind of you know authorization uh, so you create something called as privilege just like how role and role to object you have created a variable similarly you just create a you know like a variable or a something called as privilege there's nothing inside it again you just have to put it in certain rules okay maybe a function maybe a method so you put it in that and when you place it in that it means that a person with that privilege can only access that specific rule others cannot access it see this is privilege it doesn't have anything inside it so how do i use it is let's say for example let's take a flow let me open a flow So this is the flow. Oh, one second. Where do I give this privilege? No, let me. Not flows. Not flows. Oh, yeah, flows. Look at this. And the security, you give a privilege. I haven't mentioned anything right now. Here you have to make give your privilege name. So just create a privilege and give it here. So which means that at run time, when you are trying to execute the flow. it will check does it have any privilege if yes you are going to check the current requesters privileges if the person is holding this privilege he'll have he can execute the flow if not he cannot execute the flow so like this in certain rules you can provide privileges and you can restrict the rules from getting executed by unauthorized people uh like something like a flow action flow action is like a ui screen okay I'll just open the flow action. Flow actions in Pega are used to hold the UI user interface. 
okay so under security tab you can see that here you can give a privilege okay so this way you can restrict the access to certain set of rules by defining privileges in Pega. So these are the various ways we authorize a user. That is access group, the first generic high level authorization means you restrict to an application. Then you have roles, little bit, you know, specific role to object, like environment level, then privileges, rule level. Okay, so you're like, you're like, uh, you know, top to bottom, you're, you're just uh, diving deep and you're getting more and more. So the top level, you're restricting at application level. And when you reach privileges, you're actually restricting at rule level. So this way you can restrict and you can, you know, authorize the users to execute the rules. Okay, so any questions about privileges? And how do you create a privilege? I'll be making you create all these things, but just uh, but giving you idea under security, you will find privilege. Okay, you can give a name to it and just save it. That's it, and use it wherever you want to use it. Okay, so whenever an operator logs in, Pega will gather all this information. And it will store it on a debug, I mean, like on clipboard. I'll take, talk about clipboard later. And whenever you're trying to execute any rule, it will check all these criteria. Restriction levels. First one is access group. Then role. Role to object. And privileges. Okay. This one, operators, access groups, roles, role to objects and privileges. I can just put it in the chat. Okay, now. Moving on to the next topic. So for a couple of days, I'm going to discuss only theory guys, because I have to, you know, make you comfortable with few topics before I start hands on. Okay. So this is about operators and then you know, so validation and I mean, authorization and all. The next one is, uh, I mean, if you check your course content, the next one is enterprise class structure. Okay. So what exactly is enterprise class structure? ECS, we will call it as ECS in Pega. Enterprise class structure is nothing but the way you build your application in layers. Okay, it's the way of organizing the application in. It's the you can say it's a core foundation for your application. means the way you organize your classes, the way you organize your rules, the way you built up everything, we call it as enterprise class structure. It's a predefined structure given by Pega. So every application has to be built in this style. So what is a style? The style is they say that please put your rules in four different layers. The layers are organization layer, division layer, Framework layer and implementation layer. Okay, so these are the four layers in which they ask you to place your code. Why should I place them in four layers? Is there any hierarchy? Like, is, is implementation the lowest and organization the highest? Okay, I'll answer all those questions. So, yes, yes, there is a hierarchy. So, organization acts as the higher or the topmost class or the utmost parent. Then below organization, you have division and below division, you get these two together framework and implementation uh, and implementation is like below framework. Okay. So this is the hierarchy in which they are there. Okay. Organization, division, framework and implementation. So why should I build like this? Because you want to always have reusability. You don't want to rewrite the same code again and again. 
So we want to put some generic rules and we want to separate the specific rules and you want to reuse the code. So reusability, is it within the application? No. Reusability across applications as well. Across applications. Across multiple applications, you want to have reusable piece of code. So that's the reason Pega asks you to build your application in four different layers. Organization, division, framework and implementation. So what is a layer? Layer is nothing but a class. Now you ask me, what is a class? Class is just a collection of rules. So if you have 20 rules, okay, or five rules, you will say they come under organization layer or organization class, five rules under division, five rules under framework, and five rules under implementation. Okay, so you, the class is just a folder or a package which holds your rules. Now the next question is, so how will I decide which rule should come under which layer? How, how will I know Nikila? I'll tell you. So how you know is organization is the layer which holds only rules which are common across the organization, across the enterprise. Like, let's say for example, uh, suppose you guys are working for maybe um, uh, something like, let's say something like TCS. Okay, so maybe TCS is holding like five bigger projects. So if there's anything that you have built Okay, and you think, hey, this can be used across all the Pega projects of TCS, even for the new upcoming projects as well. Maybe you have built a new function. The function can, uh, you know, remove some special characters and replace them with something. It's a new function, a brand new function you have built, and you want, you need to think that this can be uh, used by all the applications in TCS. Then please put it in the organization layer. So organization, please just give me a second. I'll shift my room. Okay, just give me a moment. Now, so organization layer contains every single piece of code which you think can be reused across the application. Like I told you, maybe you have built a function or maybe you have built a new report. Reports, you know reports, right? So you have built a new report and you think, yeah, this has to be sent across the, I mean, this can be reused across all the applications of a specific organization. Okay, so just assume that you have built a report the report has to run every one month and it tells how many users are there in your application and you know it, it just determines what is the compliance and non-compliance percentage of your application so maybe this report is very generic right every application of tcs or any organization would like to run this and know like which application is doing good okay they would like to know that so it's very generic so you can place it in an organization layer so what happens when you place it in an organization layer this layer can be used by all the applications in that particular organization then they can reuse this code in that so organization layer means it's a class which holds all rules which can be reused which can be reused across all applications in that organization okay so that's organization layer example a function or a report which can be reused across all apps in that organization okay such things you can place in organization layer now division layer division layer means so within an organization you have divisions like let's say for example you have hr division you have finance division you'll have multiple divisions right so now there's a piece of code that you have built and you think this is very specific to your division and across the division every project can use it like maybe maybe just assume that it's finance division okay you have built something which um, can check the uh, maybe like years of experience of a person in your organization 
and some other information it can get you. Maybe a report you have built, uh, which can get you the technology the person is working on, the years of experience of that person, and his salary package. Okay, it'll get you that. So you thought that hey, this can be used by every single application which belongs to the finance division, and they actually need it. Everyone needs it. So you want to make it reusable. You don't want others to rebuild the same piece of code again and again. So if you think it's reusable across the division, but not across the organization, because this report is used only by the finance team. HR team doesn't need it. Admin team doesn't need it. IT team doesn't need it. Only finance team needs it. So if you think this is reusable across your specific division, then you are going to place it in the division layer. So it's a class which holds rules which can be used across. Yeah, all apps in that division, like HR, IT, and all those things. Now framework layer. See, framework layer is again optional, guys. In uh, actually in lower versions of Pega, every time we used to create a framework layer, but now it's optional because framework layer should be created if and only if you have some generic piece of code irrespective of organization and division if you hold something generic we place it in framework now in pega 8 this is optional we are creating only organization division and implementation if and only if you have some generic piece of code irrespective of organization and division then we are placing it in framework otherwise no we're not placing it so what is present in framework and when to use it suppose next comes your actual application code okay so uh, let's assume that your application is insurance and your organization supports three types of insurances maybe like vehicle insurance or uh, you know humans uh, the normal insurance and maybe like uh, let's just take two insurance types okay you're supporting two insurance types now you felt that hey there's some piece of code which is common between these two insurance types so I want to make it generic. Otherwise, I have a class called as in uh, you know, in, uh, like uh, the normal regular insurance for a person, and you have another class which holds the vehicle insurance. Now you want to put this uh, piece of code which is common at a top level so that both can reuse it. You don't want to rewrite it in the two different classes. You want to reuse it. So what you can do is in such cases you can create a layer called as framework layer. And if you have many rules and functions and flows and services and all these things which are common between these two case types and you want to reuse them, then you can place it in a framework layer. Or take another example, maybe it's a bank and you have different types of loans, education loan, vehicle loan, personal loan, marriage loan, this loan, that loan, you have different types of loans. Across all these things, maybe there's a service which is very common. This service goes and hits some external system and gets you some information about the user. And this service is common. Every type of loan requires it. So instead of rewriting it, you can create a framework layer and you can put the service there. Okay. So that way you can uh, place any reusable component okay uh, for all your different uh, you know these things you can place it in the framework layer and it's optional if and only if you think it's really required you have to create it otherwise the maintenance cost would be too high so don't create it until and unless it's actually required so framework layer it contains the generic piece of code okay and finally comes the app implementation layer this is going to hold the specific code of your application so organization layer contains very generic role very generic code which is so common at enterprise level then you come below it contains generic rules which are common at division level as you keep drilling down you finally end up at implementation layer which contains the very very specific code of your application so this this is like very much specific to your application it, it is not going to be used by anybody else so such things will place it in implementation layer okay so this is about the enterprise class structure and i'll show you in our application how that is then you'll get a better picture of it C. Always organization layer will hold the name of your organization. Suppose if your organization name is uh, uh, maybe like, uh, you know, Apple, then the organization layer name would be as Apple. 
if your organization name is like uh united health group then the organization name will be uh so your organization name will be the layer of your organization layer and your division layer finance payroll you know that will be a division layer framework and implementation you can name them as you want based on your application names okay now in my case yeah i have seen your question wasn't i'll answer it in my case look at this my i have built it for icici so icic is my organization name this is organization layer okay so it has some uh, you know rules under it the, the leaf icon indicates it's a class it is again having some nested classes below it anyways this is my organization layer ic ic is my organization layer now i want division but i haven't created any division actually i directly created organization and implementation layers only so if you had division it would be ic ic hyphen the division layer whatever it is like hr payroll whatever it is then framework and implementation right now i hold implementation so this is my implementation layer i say i say hyphen chargeback is my implementation layer so usually this is how your class names will be suppose your organization name is let's take as uh, hdfc hdfc is my organization layer division is hdfc hyphen finance or banking okay let's name it as banking if it's if you have a framework layer whatever is the application name let's say the application name is chargeback this would be a application name so it should be a framework layer okay hyphen you will have some child classes like this but anyways this will be a framework layer you will have a keyword fw like this framework fw and a keyword appended at the last like this fw and then if you have implementation it will just be like your mm, framework name but you don't find that word um, fw this will be your implementation okay so each of these are just classes holding some generic code to specific code implementation layer is the lowest layer if you just assume it like a layers in a cake okay organization layer is the bottommost layer of a cake then above that you have division layer above that you have framework above that you have implementation so implementation layer is the topmost layer which holds the very very specific layer of your application below that framework division and organization layer which can be uh, like the organization layer contains the topmost reusable code now somebody has posted me a question asking what is the difference between organization and framework layers so your organization layer contains which a uh, reusable code which is very specific to your organization so if you have some, just assume that if you have built a um, function okay uh, that is laying in the organization layer you cannot share it with another organization because your organization class will be named as hdfc how can citibank come and use hdfc classes they can't use it right so we we'll like see reusability means you should be in a position to extract the jar and you can give them so that they can import it and reuse it so if you named your class as hdfc and you have placed like 50 rules in it which are reusable can citibank or another bank come and reuse it jb morgan or someone use it no they can't use it because it is lying in your organization layer but every single application within your organization can reuse it suppose you have built a function now next i am starting a new project i'll take the jar of your organization layer okay i will place it then i'll build my own division framework and implementation layers and i can reuse your code now somebody else started building another application they will take your organization jar again and they will build the rest of the layers so that way you are going to share your code with everyone in your organization and it contains the reusable code which can be shared within the organization with multiple projects framework is different framework is like specific to your project if you have any reusable code you put it in framework layer let's say for example do you know that pegas sells frameworks there are some frameworks pega sells okay like around like 8 to 10 frameworks i think pega is selling okay so what is that framework framework is nothing but reusable or common piece of code for certain applications 
like what they do is suppose Pega Systems is holding like 10 banking, just for example, I'm saying they have 10 banking lines. Now what they do is they approach all the 10 banking lines. They try to identify the commonalities between all the 10 um, banking lines uh, workflows and they themselves design a small application. I mean, they themselves design an application which holds all their commonalities. Now what happens is next, if another bank is approaching Pega saying that, hey, I want to build my application on Pega, they say that, hey, we have most of your commonal, 70% of your project is built. We have done it in a framework layer. You take it and you customize it by writing the rest of the piece of code in your implementation layer. So that's how framework layers are. They contain very generic code of your application. So if you have another project uh, which is very much similar to it, you can just give them this whole framework layer. They can only just customize it by you know changing few things in the or overriding few things in the implementation layer. Okay, so framework layer contains the very much generic code of very of your application. Okay, it's not specific to organization; it's independent of organization and division. Okay, only sp from your application point of view, from your business point of view, they take some commonalities and they put it in the framework layer, like a service. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please. I'm supporting my organization, supporting the business and uh, banking and insurance and uh, transportation related projects. Then, uh, what are the commonalities between the banking, all the banking related sets? I can put it in the framework. framework right. So, like, like, what is the transportation and the insurance? Right. Suppose all these three together have some common. Uh, mm, Terminologies like that, uh, uh, a customer details, mm. a vendor details. Like that. I can yeah. put it in my organization level. Right, right. Organization, you are going to place it. Okay, that means what are the business I am supporting with all the business related common functionalities, we can put it in organization level. Right. The specific business related, put it on the uh, framework, framework layer. layer. Right. Respect to that application, we can put it in the implementation layer. layer. Exactly. Okay. okay, okay. So somebody has asked me a question. Did I ever work on frameworks or were we building our own frameworks? No. Most of my experience, I was building my own frameworks. So I haven't purchased any frameworks from the uh, Black Pega systems. We were building our own framework layer. Okay. It's not always mandatory to work on frameworks given by Pega. We build our own framework layer. After all, it's a class and holding some generic piece of code in it. So we have built our own. Okay, because not every framework of Pega is going to satisfy your requirement. So based on your requirement, based on the budget you have, you have to choose whether you want to go with the, uh, you know, inbuilt frameworks which Pega gives you, or you want to build your own piece of code. Okay, let me show you a diagram. I'll be sharing it. This document will be shared with you. So this is an image of enterprise class structure. Look at this. So this is the core PRPC product or the Pega platform, uh, Pega software which you take. Above this, okay, you have organization layer, you have division layer, you have framework and implementation layer. Okay, the solid lines indicate inheritance. Okay, the dotted lines also indicate inheritance, but there's something called as pattern and directed inheritance, which I'll be teaching you in the later sessions. Okay, so this is inheritance. So your organization layer is inheriting from the core Pega product. So it is like you have Pega above Pega. Actually, you can write it in. Okay, I'm mean, yeah, just think. Actually, you can write it in a different way, like a like a cake structure. If you put it, it'll be vice versa. But I can't draw that right now, so I'm just writing it. So Pega is like the bottommost layer you have. Above that, you have org layer. Okay, so again, above that you have division. 
okay then from division if you see uh, you mean like you have implementation as well and you have framework which is coming for the organization okay so organization is inheriting from or just the framework is inheriting from organization and implementation has two parents you look at this it has a connection here and has a connection here so implementation has two parents let's division layer as well as framework layer so below this again from organization layer you also get framework okay from this layer only you get framework then below this you have like this okay, with two parents division and framework so this is how you build your application whatever rules you place you can reuse them okay so any questions about ECS guys enterprise class structure that's very important from interview point of view people always keep asking you even today people ask you just explain me about the enterprise class structure okay this is also called a situational layer cake okay ECS situational layer cake enterprise class structure organization structure okay, so there are a few names for this have a look at it take a minute and let me know if you have any questions can a framework which is brought bought from Pega be implemented further of course you can customize it I mean like you can customize it in your implementation layer you can do it if not you can you know some of the rules you can modify it's okay when once you buy it you can modify some of the rules but not everything but some of the rules you can update you can customize and you can do it's like how you purchase a good from outside and I want to you know change some parts of it you want to customize it yeah you can you you bought a laptop maybe you want to change some some of the its parts you can customize it. it's now your product you can do it whatever you want so that way it is what type of questions they can ask an in interview on ECS prospective so usually they ask you to explain about ECS after that they try to put some uh, they try to give you a scenario and they'll ask you in this scenario tell me where this rule fits into will it be an organization or division of framework or implementation so that kind of questions you can accept I mean, expect or they will ask your class structure means you say like maybe I have worked in some X organization so they tell you okay tell me the enterprise class structure of your project so like I have shown you HDFC hyphen, you know, FW hyphen chargeback, FW hyphen work. So they ask you your class names, organization layer name, division layer name, framework layer name, and implementation layer names. Okay. So make sure like you, re you, you remember those class names. okay if you are good with this let's move to the next one let me pause my screen and you know get now open my course content I have opened it with some how do you determine where to put it yeah you have to think do you think this is a table which is used by every single pro project in your application then yes go ahead and place it so that's how you need to think and one more thing even though it's going to be used for every single application just make sure like uh, no, uh, people can do, don't constantly update it you, know, you have to consider all those things and you're getting it from the proper source of truth okay so though, uh, considering all those points you need to decide whether it fits into the organization layer or the framework layers okay as I told you ECS is very important when you design an application okay if you don't build ECS properly you're going to pay in long run okay so you should properly decide which which piece of code fits into which layer 
thing is like maintenance becomes difficult, reusability is lost, you know, you get all these issues. Okay, so this is what we have covered till day. Okay, and now the next one was hands-on, but I would like to start hands-on from day after tomorrow. Little more of theory and we'll start it, okay? So before this, as we spoke about enterprise class structure, let me highlight it till here. I would like to talk about classes and their inheritances. Class, class group, inheritance and types, we'll talk about it. We'll do this now. And only class, not, okay, class group and it's important. We'll talk about all these three now. We'll discuss and we'll close it. Okay, so let's start with, uh, so we spoke about layers in a tool. Every layer is nothing but a class and I have shown you the classes in my application. Now, what exactly is a class? To me, class is just a collection of rules. Okay, Class is just a collection of rules. So what do you do? Class is just like a folder holding some documents in it. Similar way, class is just a collection of rules. What is a rule? Any executable piece of code, we call it as a rule. A function, a method, a report, a decision. All these are rules. Anything executable is called as a rule. So rule means any executable piece of code is called as a rule. And class is just a collection of rules. Okay? Now, there's something called as inheritance. What is inheritance? Inheritance means taking something from the parent. You inherit something from your parent. So what is inheritance in Pega? If there are one or two or more classes, so one class acts like a parent and some other classes act like a child and they take rules. Rule reusability within the classes is called as inheritance, rule reusability. So there are two types of inheritances in Pega. One is called as directed inheritance. The other one is called as pattern inheritance. Let's start with pattern because it's simple. Pattern inheritance means naming pattern indicates your parent. The parent classes. Suppose if your class name is A hyphen B hyphen C hyphen D. Yes, in Pega the class names are this way separated by hyphens. So D indicates it's the implementation layer. Maybe C can be a division or a framework layer. A, B, organization layers that way. Okay. So every single word is a class and the last one is your implementation layer. So this is how your class names are. A stands for organization layer. B can be division, C can be a framework, and D can be the implementation. Or maybe even implementation layer can have some more childs inside them. So D can be, uh, you know, implementation. C can also be an implementation. Like that, you will have your class names. Okay, they are separated by hyphens. So pattern inheritance means your naming pattern itself indicates who is your pattern parent. Means if my current class is D, D's parent is C, C's parent is B, B's parent is A which means at runtime if I'm trying to execute a function okay first it will search in the current class D could not find it then I'll go to C my pattern parent if found well and good if not found I'll check in B found well and good if not I'll go to A found well and good if not rule not found exception will appear okay so that's how you try to identify your rules at runtime checking your pattern parents pattern inheritance Directed inheritance. So suppose you have a class A, B, C, D, and there's another class E, F, G, H, or maybe E, F, G, okay? And you want to reuse the code which is in G in the class D, but G does not come under your pattern parent. Now, how can I inherit it? I want that rule, it's very, it's reusable. I don't want to rebuild it, I want to reuse it, but it's not my pattern parent. And what you can do is you can make G as your directed parent. So direct inheritance means manually you add a class as a 
as a parent so as a parent you manually add it so you manually specify somewhere in the rules that uh, hey g is my pattern hey, g is my directed parent so now at runtime you, you should ask me a question like so which one gets picked i mean like uh, suppose if your rule is lying in uh, in b as well as in g which one it will pick always pattern inheritance takes the precedence so first pega will check in d c b a if something is not found in any of these then it will check in g f and e okay so always pattern parents first and then comes the directed parent now where do you specify this and all this i'll show you okay i am going to show you now the interview question on this is people ask you what are the types of inheritance in pega you'll answer them then they'll ask you which one takes precedence pattern or directed you can you can tell the answer your pattern always takes the precedence now the question is as you know pega is built on java java doesn't support multiple inheritance so they ask you how pega is supporting it then you can say even in even in java you has this you have this question right um, uh, like you have inherits concept you have extends concept i mean like you have this interface concept and you have extends the normal inheritance so even java was supporting the same way you are doing it one pattern parent and one directed parent so every class can have two parents okay like in java you can do one interface and one extends same way okay so somebody was asking me uh, to repeat directed inheritance see directed inheritance means like this uh, there is some piece of code which is lying in a different class but you don't have access to that class because they are not your pattern parents if my current class is d d wants to use a rule which is in g but g does not fall in my hierarchy but i want to use it then you can go and uh, mention that hey g is my directed parent then in that case you have two parents one is c b a the other one is g f e so at run time pega will check for your rules in uh, this path d c b a if not found it will check in g f e so that way you specify directed inheritance so there is a class you want to reuse the rules in it but they don't fall in your pattern path so you make them as a directed parents okay one good example guys um, yeah people ask you know do we really need directed inheritance can't we build projects in pega without directed inheritance then the then the answer is big no no you cannot sustain without directed inheritance why as i told you earlier uh, did i erase that okay uh, if you remember i told you that you have pega flat form okay on which your ecs is lying organization layer okay division layer framework and implementation you have built now pega flat form means it will have its own set of classes right maybe the class names are like this just just think that the class names are p hyphen e hyphen g hyphen a now it's your organization layer so the layer name is hdfc something now as you are building your project on pega tool it means that you are reusing the code which is lying in the pega tool right so if you are building a project in java what does that mean you are using the functions methods classes libraries of java similarly if i am building a project in pega i am using the classes functions methods and libraries of pega right so if hdfc is your organization layer and pega is your uh, you know the tool where you are building it if hdfc wants to reuse the classes functions methods xyz things of pega what inheritance do you need of course directed inheritance is there any pattern relationship between them no so without directed inheritance you cannot even build a project in pega okay so that is the importance of directed inheritance there is no relation between these two layers but i have to reuse the code so you have to establish directed inheritance okay similarly as i told you you purchase a framework from pega systems okay so it has its own organization division layer names then how can you reuse it your for your implementation layer your implementation layer is going to have directed inheritance with framework layer okay if you don't have that directed inheritance your implementation layer cannot reuse the content in the pegas framework layer 
okay so that's the power of directed inheritance and that's why it's important without that you cannot even build applications in pick okay is it clear now guys uh, sonia are you good now difference between these two yes. okay okay so that does directed inheritance work between multiple organization layers see we will not have multiple organization layers one organization will have only one layer of organization it's like see if you're if you're working for hdfc you'll have only hdfc as an organization layer you'll not have multiple multiple applications yes of course yes directed inheritance helps you to inherit between multiple applications like i told you if you purchase a framework from pega systems that's an application and you have your own application which holds an implementation layer so how do you tie up these both directed inheritance okay now you have an organization layer in your application you want to give it to somebody who has just started a bigger project under your division under your organization you want to give your jar to them then how how do they reuse your code in your jar in their application they have to establish directed inheritance between your jar file and their application any other questions guys this is what you can expect in an interviewer to ask like how big is supporting multiple inheritance because java didn't do it and what is the importance of directed inheritance can we do without having directed and which one takes precedence pattern or directive Okay, now let me show you how these things look in the application. Oh. Let me take my innermost class or the implementation class. So this is my implementation class for your POC. ICIC hyphen chargeback hyphen work dash chargeback. Now I can uh, right click on this. And say inheritance. Okay, so Etheric base class is the topmost class in Pega. Okay, the topmost class in Pega is Etheric base class. Below that you have Pegas work dash, work dash cover dash. These are all Pegas out of the box classes. Below which your application started, like I told you, like this. So you have Pega flat form okay which has some classes below that you have your organization layer this is what it is this is pega platform first class second class third class and from here my application starts now look at the inheritance type here it's directed this is what i told you if you do not have directed inheritance you can't even build an application on pega so between pega and my application it's directed inheritance and again you know this is organization layer I only have organization and implementation layers. I didn't give framework or division. My implementation layer, my implementation layer has some childs. So these are all my implementation layers. And you can see this is the director inheritance, this pattern inheritance, because the naming pattern indicates who is your parent, like this. Okay. And remember, at the rate base class is the topmost class in Pega. both means at this point you have i mean relation with this above layers so at this point you have a pattern inheritance you have a directed inheritance as well so if you look at this this is the class rule in pega okay so what it's talking about is relation with the just above layer okay so what is the name of this layer i say is a chargeback i've worked as chargeback which means the current class is chargeback and the parent is i say is a hyphen chargeback hyphen work 
So what is the relation between these two? Pattern inheritance. The naming pattern indicates who is your parent. But both means they are telling that even for this, the directed in parent is this one, it seems. So if you look in the class rule form, they ask you who is your directed parent. You have to give your directed parent name. So even the directed parent is I say it's a chargeback hyphen work. Pattern parent is also I say it's a hyphen chargeback hyphen work. So both. So both relations are pointing to the same. At a late, see, every time you don't need a directed parent, right? So you can't save a class rule without giving directed parent. So for time being, you give your pattern parent itself. But when you have a requirement and you want to inherit from a different class, you replace this with a different class. But till that time, you will have the pattern parent as a directed parent again. As both pointing to the same class, you give it as both. Let me answer the other questions in the chat. What is five and six? Five and six means I didn't get you. Is hey, it um, Nikola, if you go back to the okay. inherent oh. inheritance. Uh, okay. Yeah, so, oh, they're out of the box classes. I'm going to talk about them. Like I told you, Pega is a product, right? Even it has its own functions, libraries, methods. And of course, it has its own classes in which the rules are lying. So work dash, work dash, cover dash are all Pegas out of the box classes. Okay. So let's talk about the out of the box classes before we move to this class rule form discussion. Um, No, organization class is not a direct parent. It's it's a inherited pattern parent. So if somebody asks me, is organization layer a direct parent? No, it's a pattern parent. If you look at this, current class is chargeback. Chargeback's parent is work. Whose parent is chargeback? Again, whose parent is ICIC? Okay. So ICIC came as a pattern parent from your naming convention does come. Okay. It's not a direct parent. Organization layer has a directed parent relationship with the Pega code, with the Pega platform, but not between your layers. Okay, so if you look at this, from Pega's work dash cover dash, it has directed inheritance, but not between these layers. Okay, between Pega and this, you have directed inheritance. And this is a direct, this is a directed parent. This is a child. This is the topmost parent, right? Parent, child, you know, grandchild, and so on and on and on. Okay. So this is a parent. This is the child. This has directed relationship with this. Okay. Is it mandatory to define directed class inherited? Yes, guys, it is mandatory to give a directed parent. So if you don't have any requirement right now, I mean, like there's no class, no specific class I want to inherit as a directed parent. For time being, you can give the same pattern parent as your directed parent. Like you see here, the pattern parent and the directed parent are same. Okay, moving on. Let's talk about the out of the box classes and uh, you know, not every out of the box, few important out of the box classes we are talking about. Work dash. Few important classes I'm talking guys. Pega has a lot of classes, okay? Out of the box, but there are many. Okay, we are only talking about few important classes work data intent rule. So 
at the rate base class is the top most class in bigger. Now below that you have work data in tool and XYZ many classes are there. So what is work class? What type of rules do you place in work class? Work class usually contains business rules means functions, methods, activities, decisions, flows, UI such kind of rules you place in work class. Data class contain static data tables like you hold a table for employee details you hold a table for student details okay such kind of things will have classes called as data classes so they are only containing some static data and you use this data in your work class maybe to display like a drop down or maybe to display in a screen you use them so data classes are basically data layer you store all the data in that work classes are business rules workflows decisioning you know ui functions methods all these things are usually present in the work class data layer is data class int is completely as the name itself indicates its integration integration interacting with external systems so you use soap rest http jms mqs all these things are present in the int classes so in pega what we do is you segregate work command i mean like all business rules under work class all data layers under data class all integrations under int classes and as i told you rule is nothing but any single piece of code which is executable so all these come under pegas rule dash class rules come under rule dash class of pega okay. so just giving you an idea of some of the frequently used classes Okay. Now, if you look at your class name, there's a word as work, which indicates that this is inheriting from Pegas work dash class, and this is going to contain all business rules. Now, if you look at these classes, they have the word as data dash, which means they are data classes and they contain static data tables in them. There will be, you will be creating some classes which will hold int dash, okay, which means they'll be using integration, rule dash rules. So these are the some some of the OTB classes which you're supposed to know, especially work data and int. Okay. Now let's talk about the class rule form and the various options in it. How do you open this? A leaf icon indicates it's a class. Okay. This is a leaf, means it's a class, it's a class, all these are classes. If you expand a class, there'll be rules under them like this. These are all the rules under it. Now when I right click on a class and I say definition, my class rule form will open up. Let's see what is present in this or type of class. Yes, just like in Java, you have two types of classes. What are the two types? abstract and concrete okay so what is an abstract class abstract class means see abstract means hiding okay it's, it's hidden so abstract classes means usually uh, they contain some reusable code and we cannot create work objects for these classes so usually you know if just say for example I'll tell you suppose there's a class called as loan mm, not a good example but just assume okay there's a class called as loan and you have education loan vehicle loan or something like personal loan and so on you have okay some common piece of code between these three you kept it in loan class but whenever this person creates a new request for loan, he is going to create a transaction for education loan or a transaction for vehicle loan or a transaction for personal loan. Okay. So work objects will be created for education loan class, vehicle loan class or personal loan class. Nobody will create just a normal loan transaction or a normal loan work object. 
So what we do is to put all the commonalities I have created this class and we'll make it as abstract. Abstract means this class will not have any work objects, means no specific uh, you know, transactions or workflows will be created for this. Whereas these classes will be concrete, which means for these classes you will have work object creation. Concrete classes, they will have work objects. Abstract classes, they'll not have work objects. They just only hold some reusable piece of code, like a placeholder they are. Okay. They are present. Uh, what commonalities means? I didn't get to. Okay, it can be a workflow, a screen, a function, a decision. Such kind of commonalities you can place here. Maybe, you know, whether it's education vehicle or personal loan, you have the same registration process. There's a workflow which is for registration. You can put it in the loan class. Or maybe there's a function which, you know, can, you know hides the account number, uh, masks the account number and displays only the last four digits. That you can place it in the loan class. So that way I mean, any common piece of code, you can place it in the loan class. And the very specific one, you can place in the specific classes. So the, high, the important definition is abstract classes cannot have work object creation. Concrete classes, they'll have work objects. Abstract classes are just used to store reusable code in them. Okay, And in Pega, abstract classes, class name ends with a hyphen. But this naming convention has changed from Pega 7, guys. Usually, we used to give a hyphen if it's an abstract class. That's why you see the class names are like this. Work dash, data dash, int dash, because they're all abstract classes. Okay. So why are they abstract? Because they only contain some common functions, methods, rules in them. And you are going to create your actual classes like this. I say it's a chargeback, work dash chargeback. So this is the actual concrete class where my users are going to create the work objects or transactions. Pegas work dash is just a class which is holding some reusable functions, methods and all the stuff which I use. So that's how abstract and concrete classes differ. Work data and int are holding some common piece of code which all of us are going to use for building our projects. But this is the class where my users are going to create the work objects. So this is concrete class and work is abstract. Similarly, data, int and all these things. Any questions till here, guys? Then I'll do one thing. Uh, I'll just explain the rest of the form as well. Now, created in version. Version, rules, rule set, I'll speak about it. Just park this for now, okay? We are going to talk, it, talk about it in the next sessions. Is a class group, belongs to a class group, does not belong to a class group? Very famous interview question these days. So is a class group means as the name itself indicates, it's a collection of classes, class group. Class group, which means the name itself is telling me it's a group. So it's a collection of classes. When I say is a class group, I'm just giving shortcuts, guys. Okay, let me put it the full name. Okay, is a class group. When I say is a class group, it means that it can share its db table with its child classes okay so which means that if it's a concrete class okay you will have a db table attached to this class why you are creating work objects i mean the users are creating work objects means they're performing some transactions are you not going to store them? You have to store them. So of course you need a DB table to store them. So every concrete class will be having a DB table mapped to it. Okay, 
if you look at this at the bottom there's a test connection to the database table so if i click on test connection it's going to show me to which db table i am mapped to this is the table which it, this is mapped to okay so every concrete class will have a db table so this class is also holding a table now when i say is a class group it means that this is a parent class and this can share its db table with its child classes which means the same example suppose loan is concrete just as you know loan is concrete class okay and you said it's a is a class group and what happens it will have a table right now you have another class other classes called the education loan and vehicle loan they are also concrete classes and they say belongs to a class group so when i say is a class group it means that hey i am declaring that i am a parent when i say belongs to a class group i am saying i am a child and i belong to somebody okay someone okay so it means these are child classes these are parent classes when you say belongs to a class group it means that you don't need a separate table you are going to store your work objects in the table of your parent class that is loan when i say i am is a class group it means that i am ready to share my table with my child classes when i say belongs to a class group i am going to share the table of my parent class that is a concept of is a class group and belongs to a class group sharing tables between classes okay and then comes does not belong to a class group which means that you neither share table with someone nor you take somebody else table so you're completely independent you don't share you don't share with in anyone okay you have your own table okay so that is the difference between is a class group belongs to a class group and does not belong to a class group now if you see this it is telling belongs to a class group and it has given work so it is sharing the table of its parent class it does not have a table of its own it's sharing its parent class table instead of this if i have told is a class group i have my own table see so if you look at this oh one second if you open this class it will have is a class group i'm just opening the parent class okay if you see this it says is a class group it's telling that hey i'm a parent and all my childs can share my table and this is saying that hey i'm a child and i belong to a different class group and this is the class group so this is sharing the table with its parent this is giving its table to its children okay is a class group belongs to a class group now what is this data classes what is this work classes data classes always have does not belong to a class group which means that see if i say there's a table called as countries yes that country table is very specific only to countries i can't uh, you know use it for some other class right so as i told you data classes are specifically data layers so if i have a table called as countries i have a table called as employees i have a table called as uh, you know students nobody can share the table with other classes because they are completely unique so always data classes will have do not belong to a class group option their table is their own completely they don't share with anyone okay so work classes you usually use this is a class group does not be, i mean like belongs to a class group data classes does not belong to a class group always because they have their own tables okay awesome so that is about uh, these options now scroll let's go down encrypt blob encrypt blob means what is blob b l o b binary large object means storing data in the form of zeros and ones in binary format okay so if you think uh, when the user is performing a transaction you want to store the data in the table in binary format and you want to encrypt it maybe it's holding some secure information some password some card number cv very very secure you don't want to be even read it even the users to read it through a db table 
when you query it, they don't want, you don't want to even be in a readable format. You want to encrypt it. So in such cases, if you enable this checkbox, Pega will encrypt and store it in your DB tables. And Pega will also decrypt it when you're getting it and displaying in the UI. Okay, you need not worry about the decrypting code. Pega takes care of it. Okay. Inheritance, we spoke. Test connection to tell you the DB table details. Okay. Any questions till here, guys? Okay, so there are a few other options which I am not talking right now. Like, uh, you know, if this is is a class group, you will have some keys here, and there's something called as external mapping. You will be learning it as you keep progressing in the sessions. Okay, it will be too much if I teach you all this right now. Okay, I'm purposefully ignoring those now because as you keep moving and you start building your data class and everything, you will learn them. Okay, don't think I have skipped it. They are in the path. So that's it for today, guys. Any questions so far for the topics covered? Anything? Yeah, yeah, uh, you have told that uh, belong uh, is a class group. Mm -hmm. Is a class groups contains the uh, some uh, uh, case IDs, right? It holds some case IDs. Right. So and also belongs to a class groups also contains some case IDs. Case IDs. Right. Both case IDs will be synced in uh, belongs to a class group. Uh, right, so it's like uh, when you say is a class group, we usually choose the prefix of the this one. This prefix we usually put, and the column name will be PYID. Okay, we usually prefer the prefix of this class. I mean, like work object prefix will be there, right? So that one, and even you know, it's a column name PYID, so I can place both the class work objects in the same table. Like say for example, it's education loan and vehicle loan. So education loan work objects will have a work object ID as E hyphen one. Vehicle loan will have as V hyphen one. So even that way you can place it. So our data class frequently reused, right? So just assume that there is a web page. You have a drop down where you say country, state, city. You have a drop down. So where do you get this data from? From a data table. So in Pega, this data classes whole data tables okay and this data you fetch it and you use it in your work classes maybe you have a table called as employee details so that will be lying in the data class you fetch it and you use it in your work classes that's how it works which class holds the inputted data work classes as you see work classes also have tables so whatever transactions or the work objects you are performing in the application will all be stored in the work class related database tables. Okay, whereas the raw the static content which you store and you use to display in the UI when the user is performing a transaction in your application, such things are stored in the data classes. Suppose let's say for example, you know, uh, let, just give me a second. I'll open a website. I'll pause my screen. Okay, sharing my screen. Look at this. Uh, suppose uh, you say mobile operator, you do a down arrow. Is it not coming? Oh, sorry, this one. This is coming, right? So this is coming from a data class. Okay, the static content, they store it in the data class and they display it. When you click on browse all plans, 
Oh, one second. Okay, let me select an operator. So there's a kind of list of this. This is all data class. Again, you select something. This is all data class. Static content which is coming is all data class. Now I go and make a transaction and recharge my mobile. So that data will be stored in work classes. Okay. So the transaction which you perform is a part of work class. The static content which displays on the screen is from the data class. Okay. Is, is that clear now? Any other questions guys? It mean any work class is considered data inputted by the user. Yes. Okay. Okay guys then that's it for today. Uh, see you tomorrow. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. Um,